Welcome in to another episode of Your Drone Questions Answered, brought to you by Drone Launch Academy. I'm your host, Chris B. Love. Today's question is this, what are some best practice recommendations for target placement for both LIDAR and photogrammetric missions? To help me answer that question, I'm excited to welcome our guest, Eric Harkins of Back 40 Aerial Solution. Eric, thanks so much for joining the show. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me, man. So before we get into it, Eric, just would you tell our listeners a little bit about your, your kind of professional background and all of your experience in aerial mapping and kind of what led you to your business that you're running today? So I have a, an eclectic professional experience. I, I had an education at the University of South Carolina. I was doing history, kind of failing classes, and I had to take extra classes over the summer, and I found GIS. That's where I started with the maps. From there, I ended up transferring to Clemson, finished there, getting my forestry degree, and then I learned more because you know forestry is a larger scale, like a landscape level map you know, about aerial photogrammetry, you know, at the time they were kind of teaching us plotting for planes. Right. And, and so after that, I ended up working society of American foresters and then the city of Columbia, South Carolina GIS department. And one day I'm out there just on the ground with the GPS shooting manhole covers. And I was like, golly, this is miserable. There's gotta be a better, better way to do this. And then a year or two later, somebody sent me some uh, EB videos when they were mapping the Matterhorn. And I was like, wow, that would be useful. And so uh, that started my process, right? It started my journey. And then I eventually decided in 2015 to start this company. My first drone was a Precision Hawk Lancaster version three. And then we ended up with a Phantom three and that, that really started it. So taught myself photogrammetry from that Pix 4D. A few years in, uh, we really decided basically because of accuracy requirements and some regulatory stuff in our market that LIDAR really needed to be where we should start focusing. Um, and when I went that route, I was like, oh my gosh, I can see the whole picture, right? Because photogrammetry is really only just what the camera can see. And now LIDAR is showing me depth. So really in the last five years. That's where I spent the majority of my career is focusing on, on LIDAR and photogrammetry mapping work. Yeah. No, that's awesome, Eric. So for our question for this week, first of all, let's define, I'll have you define for our listeners, what's the difference when someone says GCP or control point, ground control point versus a check shot in the context of aerial mapping? So it's in the two words, control versus check, right? So the control is what you are aligning or registering your data to. And then your checks are outside of those points to validate your alignment, to make sure that you're getting the data that you think you're getting in between the GCPs. Because in photogrammetry, essentially when it creates the port cloud, it tries to warp it to those control points. And so sometimes if your control points have errors, you know, you may see a warp between two parts of the triangulation in the point cloud and then your check shots allow you to take a supplemental validation of your assumptions of that alignment. LIDAR is a little different because you have strip alignment when you're moving between your, your strips, right? And so you, at least I, attempt to align everything by a mean error, mean vertical and horizontal error within our control points. And then we use our check shots to make sure that any alignment or flight paths in between those are aligning as well. And then obviously with LIDAR, you have trajectories, so you have a little extra data there that you can start looking at and reporting to see if there's other causes for that. Yeah, perfect. Like you said, check shots not used in registration to independently, keyword independent, right? Verify what you've done. So one thing I'll say, it doesn't mean that when we talk about setting targets, obviously, um, and I guess we should define that for folks. It's some kind of shape, right? Could be checkerboards, could be chevrons, meaning arrows, could be a lot of different things. But I think it's worth pointing out too that Anything that's going to be used as a GCP has to be targeted, right? There has to be, and it can also use existing features, right? Uh, tips of turn arrows, stop bars, that kind of thing can be used. Not always ideal when you talk about that. But I also want to just point out for our folks that you can have more targeted points than you actually use as control points. And now you can even validate. Now, those line. become your check shots. It, right? It, exactly. Right. But I know some people get confused when they're new to this concept of, okay, so if I set a target, that's a control point. Well, it has the potential to be right. You have, you have to decide that as the analyst, do I include it in my registration or not? Right. So just want to get that kind of caveat out of the way at a high level, let's just say you've got a new project and let's just say it's a LIDAR project for, for the sake of the discussion. What are your kind of initial thoughts? Okay. Based on size of the site, you know, layout, and I guess let's start there. How are you going to lay out your control targets? The simplest way to think about this is there's 
there's there's kind of three elements. I want to box the site in, right? So I am placing targets around the edges of the geometry to create kind of a box like you would in a boundary. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in the project area. It's just around the geometry of that area. And then obviously I'm trying to add points on the interior. And then if possible, I'm looking for points at my highest elevations and my lowest elevation, right? So I'm constraining it X, Y, and Z to, to create control points along those three axes so that I can make sure that things at, at the bounds of our project and, at, and within them are aligning. A lot of this stems from your, your altitude, right? Your ground sampling distance, right? So if you're in photogrammetry, obviously the closer you are to the ground, the more resolution you have on your targets. And so if you're flying at 225, a one foot target, like these Aerotoss targets that I have, that's visible easily. Right. You can easily mark the center of that. If you're flying a little higher, well, maybe, maybe you're doing it like 400, maybe you want a two by two. And if you're doing it from a plane, you know, a three by three or a four by four. And when I say that, I mean feet, those will allow you obviously at your different scales of resolution to accurately pick out your center of your target. The other thing that I, I really like to look at is your lighting conditions. So again, we'll just kind of take this in two tracks. You got photogrammetry, right? If you got a bright day, you know, clouds rolling through using something like that Aerotoss target instead of a black and white, I know that it's not necessarily going to get blown out, right? So I see that a lot of, and I've learned over the years that, you know, that white part of your target can get blown out on a really sunny day. The other piece of that is, you know, it takes into shutter speed and aperture and those parts of the photogrammetry bit. But in LiDAR, that's not necessarily a challenge. You can fly LiDAR at night. And so at that point, it becomes about material and material and reflectivity or in, it creates an intensity value. Again, to go back for an example, the narrow tops targets in the intensity value, this is the same. I just see a red square yep. on the, on the colorized intensity. Whereas with these targets, right? My black is a void more or less. So I'm looking for that void. And then the differential between the void and the adjacent. And that's how I'm doing my, my vertical and horizontal alignment. So material as well, you know, I used to use a lot of the vinyl targets when I first started out, you know, you see them all the time on Amazon. A lot of my sites, I put these two by twos out because this is actually two sheets of aluminum with a sheet of rubber. It's really tough, right? <laughs> and so the only thing that really ever moves those, once you put a six inch nail through the middle of it is heavy equipment. And so if I have like dirt projects that we're monitoring over the course of months or years, we set the control once we come back to it, I can check back in on the same ones and, and, you know, we can make sure they haven't moved. So they're very durable in that way. Whereas the vinyl targets and the paper ones, those are more of a, Hey, we're going to lay these out and leave. And never we're expect not, them to use them again without. Yeah. We're not coming back target. for those probably. Yep. yep. Um, whereas, you know, these are $55 a pop. You know, that's kind of the way that I look at it because the, in, again, in photogrammetry, it's more like your exposure. I think if I order these again, or when I go to order another set of these, cause I order them by the hundred, I'm going to change that white to a more of a, a 20% gray, and that will help in the blowout of the photogrammetry. That's the biggest kind of consideration there. And I've seen lots of other people over the years use different color combinations. I think for, you know, photogrammetry talked about using objects in place right? In LiDAR too. So looking for crisp geometry. We also have stencils that we use, but I love manhole covers. I love mm -hmm. stop bars. You know, not all of them are painted exactly. If they're crisp, they're great, right? I also like parking stripes. Hey, we're going to just make it down in your data collection, third, fourth, fifth parking stripe, you know, shooting the end of that thing. And those are great for horizontal alignments, vertical alignments. They may not be the, as precise as the shapes that you're trying to find that, that precise geometry on, but they're absolutely great using anything else in the field that's already there is going to save you time and effort. To talk about the stencil, we made the stencil in a circle instead of a square. So it's still a two foot diameter all around the circle, but now it fits perfectly over manhole covers. And so we can paint that in. The other kind of tip I would add on stencils is a lot of asphalt, you know, it's kind of old and grayed out, right? So I'll come in and put a layer of black matte down before I paint the actual opposing white color on that stencil. And it helps it pop a lot better. Contrast is king. 
particularly on the LIDAR side, obviously. What about shape? I mean, like in your case, obviously you got the circle stencil for manhole covers. You got the iron cross, but it's still a square, but like Pix4D and I think a lot of other tools now are getting to like automated target detection, right? Just to aid right. that, that step. I think the, the old school, like tried and true is like a two foot by two foot checkerboard. Do you ever decide like, Hey, in this particular project, I'm going to like focus on a certain shape just because of whatever software you're going to use. Is that ever part of your, your calculus? It hasn't been to date just for me. I will say that in terms of using like that checkerboard on the Aerotos targets versus what we call the iron cross. Uh, I like this better because you have two arrows, you have four triangles, right? Pointing to the center. So yeah. for some reason, there's a, some tree branch obscures your field of view on part of it, or, you know, there's a shadow that rolls over and you can get part of it. It's the same part of the same geometry, right? Instead of just using squares, it's a scaled up. But that's just my personal preference. I find those to be easier because again, the arrows there's longer edges of geometry that point mm -hmm. to the same place. I've seen a lot of people, you know, they'll use the stencils for propeller, you know, just kind of four arrows point to the center. Anything that gets you to an actual center point, I'm in favor of, right? Like we were saying, it could be a chevron. In my, again, personal experience, I like this inside point of the chevron. Right. Oh, rather than, rather say, than right? trying to get the tip <laughs> yeah. because it's that contrast, right? You're going to get a darker contrast there rather than the edge where it kind of seems to bleed. You got to coordinate with the, with the field crews, right? I was gonna right? Say, if yeah. you're not the one out there shooting all your stuff, you've got to coordinate those needs to your field crews about what you want to see as a standard. You know, if we're shooting stop bars, Hey, is it the edge of the stop bar closest to the inside of the intersection? Is yes. it back? Are you doing that? What if you have a manhole cover that isn't quite seated in the center of the storm drain, right? Sometimes that stuff gets, I don't know, manufactured oddly, very rare, but you know, just things like that, communicating with whoever's doing the check shots, if it's not yourself or the field shots, that's critical too, and good note taking so that whoever the analyst is in post-processing knows exactly what they're looking for. Absolutely. Which to your point, I'll double tap on the air. It's like, yeah, the, all the square based targets, whether it's iron cross or checkerboard, eliminate that ambiguity. When using those existing features, like you said, or maybe striping chevrons with a tape roll like this or paint, be consistent. And granted, I would hope and think like, oh, this is a six inch wide tape roll. So like the tip of that versus let's call it the elbow is several inches off to the point that you would hope if let's say there was 12 of these set and the field person just made a mistake and, and shot it in the, the wrong spot from the rest of them. That should hopefully like flag for the analyst, but again, make it easier on the team, right? Be, be consistent, yeah. be consistent, be consistent. Well, if you're running photogrammetry, right? And you pick the wrong spot, now you've shifted your data. Yep. Absolutely. In LIDAR, it's going to show up where you be like, Hey, I can ask that question, but in photogrammetry, you know, some of the software is more suggestive yep. of where it thinks, especially Pix4D, right? Where it thinks it should be. Yep. And that That's can be true. confusing for people too. 100%. And also to your point about the iron cross, I like that. This might be a little large. We'll see if this even shows on the camera. Yeah, there's the vinyl. But I like the stakeable ones in this context for, you know, dirt, turf, that kind of thing. And obviously these little circles, I'm just gonna, this is folded in half. It's more of a hexagon, right? But these are reflective, of course. But to your point about the iron cross, same thing, right? And I use this one. This is a four foot one for just fixed wing lighter acquisition because I can't slow down my speed, obviously. But to your point about the iron cross, if any of those several circles are missed or obscured out enough points or returning off of them, I can still find my center using really a total of just two or three versus all seven. I like that sort of redundant, if redundancy is the right word, but you know, use a target that's more forgiving if things aren't perfect. Like I think you said earlier, obscuring whatever else, speed, whatever else the case may be. And you mentioned longevity, right? With the aluminum targets. What about, I guess, your view on maybe someone has already set a bunch of control, you're trying to now repurpose their existing nails. Do you like doing that? Or would you say, Hey, if this wasn't set at the same time as my target was placed, maybe I'm going to disturb it. Or, and if so, if, if you're okay with that approach, what is your go-to move to say, Hey, I've been given that control file by the project surveyor, but nothing was targeted. We're going to go back after the fact and try to make sure we set whatever target type in such a way that we're with that nail. And we're not causing any disturbance. Do you ever do that? Would you ever do that? If they're PK nails along a road, 
that's where the stencil comes in. It's easy to, to just come on top of that PK nail and, and paint the stencil over in the same location. Great, done. A lot of times the question is whether or not they shoot it in somewhere that is favorable to the drone, right? I've had to kind of teach some customers and their field crews like, hey, we're going to go out here and scout this site with ortho. I'm going to tell you, here's where I see the gaps in the canopy, especially in large forested sites, right? This is where I'm going to put the target. So if you're going to go shoot some boundary or checks or whatever, make sure you get here, right? Yep. And then drop them a pin so that they can put in their collector and navigate, right? So try again, trying to go back on that to, I know it's not your exact question, but trying to get ahead of that. Yep. If you have the relationship, good working relationship to be able to do that is one, that's one way that I address that. The other is really whether or not they're using irons, right? Because a lot of times it's more or less them locating something that's already there. Yep. Uh, sometimes it is a traverse nail, you know, it's, it's whether or not it's flush with the ground. Yep. Cause for me, the vertical is really important. And if they're shooting it with total station, then that's absolute trying to match up the target you know, shoot, man, sometimes we take the weed eater out there or a spade and we try to clear the area around, around that nail. A lot of times though, the field crews just didn't put them in places we can repurpose. That's part of growing your relationship with your customer or your field crew to refine your joint workflow, to augment what they're doing in the field for your purposes as well. Sometimes it's just about, Hey, I bought 20 of these. I do a lot of work with this client. These are part of the job. I'm loaning these out to you guys, have your field crew place them. I'm going to fly it with ortho. Here's where I'd like them to place it when they start getting work on the boundary. Yep. Or as we've talked about, Hey, yeah, there's existing nails, but your existing nail is only 20, 30 feet off of this manhole over here. Can you go set back up and shoot that? Can you go shoot this stop bar? Can you give me something else off of what you've already shot? That's close by and is still favorable to being visible from the air. Absolutely. I think that, that's, that's the like byline of all that is like, I love those different strategies, right? You can catch on the front side, be proactive is ideal, not always an option or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's, it's communication, good project planning, remobilizing with that mindset, right? Of it's very different doing conventional survey. If no one's worried about anyone ever seeing it or scanning it from the air. So yeah, just. I guess re retooling people's thought process, I think is, is the key there. So just to do one caveat to that, I mean, we work with checks and balances, right? And so the more shots you have on the same location, the better understanding you have of that location. When we place our GCPs, we shoot them ourselves. We provide that to the surveyor, but the surveyor doesn't use it as their primary control. They go out and shoot it. We hold it as an additional check, right? So if something comes back, we've had this happen through the years, somebody didn't change a rod height, right? Or somebody was out there using Basin Rover, but it was a high KP day, right? A lot of geomagnetic interference. You know, there, there's a bit of a bust between the two. Iron sharpens iron here. That's what we're doing. We're, we're providing that as additional context, not only so that they know where to go find it, if there is an issue, they have another set of data that they can they can incorporate to to validate and check what they've done. Absolutely. Redundancy is certainly helpful. Not always maybe in the budget and those sorts of things, but when you can work it in, it can save the day, right? So that's awesome. Well, Eric, man, again, thank you for the time. Before we get out of here, if folks want to reach out to you for Back 40 Aero Solutions or just to continue these types of conversations with you, if you're up for it, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? Generally by email or by phone. Our main company number goes goes to my cell phone, so I can, I can pick that up. That's 803-727-5551. My email is eric at back40, and that's F-O-R-T-Y, drones with an S, dot com. I'm happy to help and consult for people where they need it. Absolutely. I really appreciate that, Eric. Appreciate your time this morning. For our listeners, again, as always, if you have a question you want us to tackle on this show, please uh, email me at chris at dronelaunchacademy.com. Visit ydqa.io or it's in the Drone Launch Connect community. Submit your questions there. Until next time, have a great week.